Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 124, Robin Stimson and the Importance of Being Valued. Here's a shout out to listeners in Hungary, Usima, Finland, and in the United States, Sandy, Utah, and Lebanon, Ohio. With that, let's get started. Robin Stimson is the owner of Forward Bravery, and she's a manager of victim services where she helps individuals who have been injured or lost loved ones. Robin received her master's in social work from the University of Maryland in Baltimore, and since then, she's been working with nonprofits. Her social work experience has enabled her to advocate, educate, and prepare victims and survivors for everything from the criminal justice system to handling loss and obtaining renewal. I met Robin when we were both involved in the International Society for Performance Improvement, or ISPI, and I'm proud to have her on the podcast. Part 1. Accepting Change In my research, I've identified seven leadership principles. The first one, believe in others, is so simple yet also often misunderstood or underappreciated. In this story, Robin shares with us some of her experiences, which illustrates why this principle is so important. Here's Robin with her story. My mom told me once that you can lose people in many different ways. At the time, I I was probably in high school or younger, and, and that was just not a concept that made any sense to me because I thought that the only way to lose someone would be after they passed away. As you get older, friendships change, your relationships with colleagues change, with your children, they can change, neighbors. And it really is true. In a way, it was very freeing to me, and I find it to be very freeing because I don't feel like this particular person has to be in my life or this particular thing has to be in my life and has to look the same as it did in the beginning. And to I've really just sort of learned to be okay with living in the moment and taking things as they come. Things change. Life is change, and change is constant. Sometimes you feel constrained to not do those things because you don't want to lose the person, place, or thing in your life. You end up being stuck in this horrible place where you know that (laughs) this is not a tenable situation, or you know that you have an opportunity to do something different, but your fear or your trepidation over the possible losses are more powerful to you or weigh a little heavier on you than what the the possibility of the intervention might be, Um, or or getting involved or making making that decision or saying that thing. It's just easier to kind of stay quiet. Usually I use it even when at work now or talking to my friends, I say it to people all the time and that you really, you can lose people in all different kinds of ways. And instead of looking at that as a sad thing, it should be something that you just kind of accept about life and accept that change is a constant. When I went to high school, my senior year, we started this class called a leadership council. My history teacher, whose name was Mrs. Johnson, approached me and said, I would like you to be on the leadership council class. It's brand new. It's a class of other high school seniors and your class will plan the entire senior year of your high school. And so that meant everything from homecoming and what our float was going to be to the theme of prom, who our commencement speaker would be. And it was such a rewarding experience. I wish I could find Ms. Johnson and thank her because I am not sure uh, what she saw in me at 16 or 17 that uh, told her to reach out to me and ask me to be in this class. I take a lot of those lessons I learned in that class even today. I mean, we, we were students from all over, different races, cultures, ethnic backgrounds, gender identification, all working towards a common goal. Being able to make decisions and have, feel autonomy and feel that we mattered. We actually had products that we had to provide to other students. You decide what the theme is going to be for the prom or you, you know, decide who the commencement speaker is going to be. And you could actually present it to the student body as something. And it was like, this is something that we came up with. Tangible. And it was quick. You know, it wasn't something that was four or five years down the road. I would say that throughout my, most of my young life, there have been a lot of teachers who have anonymously nominated me for things, asked me to be on things like this leadership council. And I wish to thank them and all teachers 
maybe you do get a lot of thanks now, but it used to be a thankless profession at times. Those things really mattered to me. When I was a kid, I didn't really feel like anybody could see me. Sometimes as an adolescent, you don't want to be seen. Teachers can have a different perspective of students than the, what the students have. Right. And it isn't just nominating someone. It's also just saying a couple of things or giving some advice. The teacher may not even remember ever doing it, but it could stick with the student for years and years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was not a popular kid. I mean, usually those leadership councils, you would need to be the president, you know, voted president or vice president. And and absolutely, those individuals were also in the the class. I don't know how I was presenting at the time. You know, you sort of feel awkward, like you just don't even have a lot of confidence, usually when you're 17, 16, 17. So something that I said or did or how I was behaving stuck with her enough to reach out to me. And, you know, certainly she has to go out on a limb and talk to this jaded teenager who thinks nothing is cool (laughs) uh, and ask me to join something, which is also not cool. But I did. And it was one of the most important experiences that kind of shaped my life because I felt like my voice mattered and that I could do difficult things and I could work with people of different backgrounds and, and we could come up with things that would make a lot of people happy. Feeling needed, feeling valued are needs that everyone has. Yeah. When you feel appreciated, when you realize that people around you value what you do, it changes everything and changes your motivation and engagement. Absolutely. For me, I've learned that there are certain career paths that I'm just not meant for. And one of the reasons is sort of the expediency in which you can implement change. I like to be creative. I pride myself on being creative. I like to come up with ideas and see them come to fruition. This was a really good dry run of that because we had a senior year. So you can't have prom next year when you're, I mean, you could, but it'd be somebody else's prom. Yeah. Um, You know, your commencement, that date was set by the county and that's when your graduation would be. And so who's going to speak and what does the program look like? Getting different input from different people at different times for different things. It was really very special. And I hope they still do them in schools. Because people who are kind of voted into class president, class secretary, class treasurer, et cetera, definitely bring a lot to the table. But there are other students or other individuals in the school who also have something to say and speak for a constituency, if you will, even though it may be a high school or a middle school. So I was very, very honored to be on that and enjoyed it very much and still friends with people from that class to this day. Part two, courage and good trouble. In my book, Nine Practices of 21st Century Leadership, I describe nine leadership practices that you can apply to any role. One of the practices is communicating like agents. The idea, it's pretty simple. In many situations, there are people without a voice that aren't able to advocate for themselves. There are those who could represent them and advocate for them. In this story, Robin illustrates communicating like agents. Here's Robin with her story. I received my master's in social work in 2016. I have a varied professional background. I actually started working in finance right out of college and then working in professional associations, you know, moving into nonprofits. That's really where my passion lies. I think I've always felt passionate about advocacy advocating for others, encouraging people to advocate for themselves, because I just, I don't even know, I I mean, would not be a very good one-on-one counselor, social worker, because I hear the stories of the families or individuals I talk to or work with, and I immediately want to cheer them on into letting other people know the power of their words, advocating on behalf of them if, if I'm honored to be able to do so. Sometimes advocacy I think we all kind of think of it as trying to convince somebody or tell a group of people or a person why something is important, why something should be changed, why something matters, why something should be talked about or talked about less. You can also advocate within your organization. I have found, and maybe it's just because of social work school, I feel like I'm in that position a lot. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, I think social workers are were sort of taught to really look at a problem or a system or a program from 30,000 feet. And again, this works well for me because I'm not the most detail oriented person. So I really like that perspective. It may not work for everyone, but for me, it works quite well. What are we trying to achieve here? You know, what is the problem? What is the issue? What are we trying to address? And then looking at something 30,000 feet, you know, again, as I kind of mentioned in the previous question, you're working with people who come from different backgrounds or different perspectives or different areas and certainly priorities. I have been oftentimes in situations where I, it's sort of crickets, you know, somebody says, mm. well, what does everybody think of this idea? And then I'll kind of chirp up and go, um, I think that I don't like that idea or I, <laughs> uh, or I think that it's a great idea. I like the intent behind it, but I think we should approach it differently. I work with another social worker. She actually is a victim advocate in another state. It's funny because when we're in meetings, she and I are both usually the first ones to kind of say, um, let's, I think there's a different way to do this or a different way of thinking about it or a different way to approach it. I won't give too much detail, but there was a project that um, was sort of coming to me from up above. The intent behind that project was very necessary and important. It was really to expand outreach to a certain group of people. But I did not agree with the way that we were being asked to do it. And I was really trying to communicate that to those above me, that it's not necessarily the intent, but it is the process. Currently, I work in an organization where families that I, that I work with are survivors of substance impaired driving, and they have been, they've either lost a loved one or have been injured as a result of a substance impaired driving crash. Knowing that changes a lot for me on how anything should be implemented, because you really are looking at being more trauma-informed, more empathetic. You really have to have just a basic understanding of trauma and what that looks like, because otherwise you're not engaging with them and meeting them where they are and providing support and services to them. You're sort of telling them what you think they need, which I don't really think is a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. It makes your job a lot harder. I was in the minority on how this particular project should be implemented. It really upset me. I'm literally in my stomach. I sort of just felt like in knots. I just did not feel comfortable moving forward with how we were asked to move forward on this particular thing. It required a lot of conversations and sleepless nights, knowing that I was going up against people who really were the decision makers for some of the decision makers for the organization, or certainly for this particular program, and worrying about how I was going to be perceived. I don't want to be perceived as someone who's not a team player or who just constantly is the cog in the wheel or the, the bump in the road. The troublemaker. The troublemaker. I use that feeling in my stomach to guide me. And it's very important for me to be able to sleep at night. I don't say this to say I was asked to do anything unethical. That is not the case. But when you're thinking or advocating on behalf of individuals who have been traumatized and working with them on a daily basis and talking to them on a daily basis, you're really very mindful of what you're asking of them to do and asking of them for how they could, could behave. And it, it just changes your life in the best way to make sure that you really are trying to make things go much smoother for them. You really captured it. When you're working with a group that has dealt with a lot of trauma, you meet where they are, where they're ready and what they can handle rather than pose something that may not be in sync with their current needs and could be pushing them in a way that isn't the best for them. Right. And that's sort of where that brand recognition comes from, you know, and the responsibility of being an advocate for an organization that's known all over the world for helping and providing support. It is a currency and you don't want to spend it in the wrong place. That's how I feel. Because you want people to always associate the work that you do with the type of services and support that they need. And you don't want to change the focus for that. You don't want them to feel like, well, I wonder, I don't, why, who would have thought of this? Or I don't want this, or I, I'm not, I'm not connecting to this in some way. And I'm surprised that Robin would offer this to me or give this to me or, or ask me to, to do this or that. 
And again, it's not that it was anything bad or unethical. It really is just the focus for me and for working with families and victims in this particular role is to provide support to them. And if it's any type of sort of kind of heavy lift for them, I don't want to do it. (laughs) And I don't ask them to do it. You can come and butt heads a little bit with certainly program staff, maybe, or fundraising. If you're looking at, you know, how do you sustain an organization? Like these are important questions and not easy ones. It's not easy to be sort of the troublemaker, if you will, or the one who gets to be the, you know, the person on the rock saying all these fantastical things and where everyone else is like, well, yeah, but we also have an organization to run. So I get that. When people at higher levels, they make decisions, they want to look for confirmation that they made the right decisions. But when someone disagrees and says, look, there's, you know, maybe you you didn't do enough analysis or something like that. The way our brains work is we're resistant to that. It's very easy to be misinterpreted as the cog in the wheel, so to speak, someone who's just not a team player, as as you said. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that it, it is a challenge. It is. I really value communication with as many people as possible, as often as possible. And so there were conversations had, you know, this wasn't me just standing with my arms crossed. Nope, won't do it. You know, really was to try to get the point across that I really care so much about this organization and so much for the victims that I work with and will work with in the future that I don't want to do anything to damage that. The intent behind the plan and the outreach and like kind of what we were hoping to be able to do is a good one and an important one. But can we maybe shift the focus to being able to do that in a way that honors the work that we do with this specific population that, like it or not, have specific and important needs? I think that goes a long way and it went a long way in currying kind of favor to ultimately have the program be changed. Uh, It certainly wasn't overnight and it wasn't happily met with wonderful reception at, at first, but because the meaning behind it for me was really thinking about this group of people and how this might be perceived by them. One, it made my job easier to advocate for them because I that's what I'm supposed to do. And two, I took sort of the ownership out of it and said, let's think about them, what situations they would be in, how we would be interacting with them around this particular initiative. And are there other ways to do it where we honor them? There is such a thing as good trouble. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Um, there is. And you just have to, I don't say be persistent in that you're just stubborn, but get to really what it is about the idea that bothers you or the approach that bothers you. Distill it down to the bare bones. Communicate this as best you can to your team and your colleagues and those that want to listen. And then, you know, at some point you have to kind of go along, you know, whatever everybody decides, you don't want to constantly be the one that can't do it, but you will feel better. And I felt better that whatever happened with this particular initiative, I spoke out, I talked to who I needed to, I made my thoughts and concerns known. And the reasons behind those thoughts and concerns I thought were valid. Whatever happened at that point, I felt okay. Being able to say, I really did all I could to affect positive change in this particular case. I think you really did a good job clarifying that everyone had the best intent. Mm -hmm. How you get there may not have been thought out in the best way for those that you're trying to advocate for and and help. You're raising your point, raising your hand, saying, look, I need to express my perspective and share a different way of looking at it. If you did that, if you articulated yourself well, and they chose to stay with the implementation, Mm -hmm. then you did your part, you advocated it, and now you just have to move on and do the best to make the project as successful as possible. Or they make some modifications and you've made it better for the recipients of that service. Yeah. Sometimes it just, you can get so discouraged. Just what's the point? You know, they asked me to do it. So I just have to do it. I'm employee 100 out of 500 employees. And what I say doesn't matter, but it might not lead to the change that maybe you're seeing in your mind, right? On that particular example. Yeah. But it is important to practice using your voice. You will learn something about yourself, your limitations, what matters to you, 
how to get your point across, uh, how to say things to, you know, the same things to different audiences, there is a value in it, even if the end result may not have been what you wanted it to be. I just think that we get so stuck and kind of look around us and go, well, nothing, it doesn't, nothing matters and there's no point, but there definitely is a point. And, and personally, professionally and personally, it does matter and, and you will be stronger for it and wiser for it and be able to respond to questions like this. You raise a valid point. There's a lot of organizations where executives hire the brightest and best people that they can find, which is great. And they want people who are creative, who can innovate, who can do wonderful things. But too often, those same executives, when you're in the role, they want to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And they limit your ability to be creative and innovative. What you raised was a point by uh, Liz Wiseman in Multipliers. She talks about this and other people do too as well, is that if you get to the point where all you're doing is you're taking orders and just doing it, you become part of the living dead. You walk around and you're not happy. You're not contributing the way that you feel you could. You become complacent and just do your job. And when you do that, then the end products are not going to be at the quality that they could be when you're more engaged and you, when you hire those people, you allow them to be able to be creative and innovative and let them have input in how projects are implemented. Right. Those above me who are, who are trying to make these decisions or implement this particular initiative, I have and had a lot of respect for them. And they really, within reason, reached out to me to try to understand my position. So if you are a leader in an organization and you present this idea, you've been up all night and it's like the best idea ever, and you present it to your team and it's met with either crickets or some dissenters, uh, some, some good troublemakers like myself, it's hard, but if you can try and step outside of your ego a little bit or a little bit outside of just your excitement over the idea, because ultimately you can make the decision to say, well, yeah, I appreciate everybody's input, but this is the way that we're going. But it goes a long way to have conversations with those good troublemakers. I know I felt heard. I did not feel like this was just being stuffed to me and here you need to do it. We ultimately may have come to different sides of the coin on it, but there was a legitimate and heartfelt effort to try to understand where the other side was coming from and to at least bridge some of those gaps so that you can get to the point where everyone knows the intention is good. And you can get to the point where, okay, there's 10 of us here, but we may not agree on six of these ideas. In our conversations, we agree on three of them. So how do we move the needle on the other three if we even need to do that? So there is value in taking the time to understand the dissent instead of being offended by it or... Or bulldozing on. Right, or bulldozing on. Absolutely. Part three, strengthening your courage muscle. In recent episodes, guests like Kim Campbell, have talked about courage and how important courage is in leadership. Like Kim, Robin talks about courage and advises us on how we can become more courageous. Again, here's Robin. I read an article and I, I wish, unfortunately, I wish I could properly credit the writer. The theme, basically, of this article, and it was about courage and bravery, is that courage is a muscle. It requires practice, it requires patience, and it requires intention. I talk about me having my master's in social work. I received my bachelor's in history, modern American history specifically, and then looking at some of the individuals that I researched and wrote about that are lauded in these incredible books and movies and documentaries. At the time, what they were trying to do was usually not so lauded, appreciated. They were ridiculed, chastised, often isolated, sometimes in danger of their lives. They may have even lost their lives for some of their ideas, opinions, or actions. Sometimes doing the right thing, it doesn't feel good in the moment. Our bodies really are kind of trained to kind of go along to get along evolutionarily wise. We wouldn't survive if we were all the troublemakers. But I think it's important to know that, you know, when you're doing something that you know or you believe to be true and you believe is the right thing, you may get a lot of criticism for it. 
you may not have a lot of people rallying behind you. And you certainly are not going to get a parade, (laughs) at least not initially. But it's important to try. And there are small ways to practice courage. One of the things you can do is just even to yourself, admit, I may fail at this. I might not be right about this. I may make a mistake, not to put yourself down, but to really put things into perspective for whatever you're trying to accomplish. It doesn't have to do with self-esteem. It really has to do with training yourself to know that you might have to go out on a limb and you might be the only one. Bob from accounting may be agreeing with you totally. Yeah, go ahead, do that, you know, fight that good fight. And when it comes down to it, Bob from accounting is going to have his arms crossed on the other side of the room while you kind of are like (laughs) feeling like you're on an island. That's going to happen. I think it's important for all of us to sort of find a way to be comfortable with that feeling that you are sometimes going to say things that no one else agrees with. You are going to have to sometimes speak truth to power, tell those of those individuals that make the decisions that you may not agree with their decisions or how they're going about their decisions or, or whatever. And that doesn't feel good. <laughs> you can get a knot in your stomach. You can lose sleep over it. You may lose friends or colleagues, hopefully not, but sometimes business opportunities. But the important thing is that if we all just live in comfort and don't push ourselves outside of comfort, then nothing changes. We don't change. The systems don't change. And you don't help the organization. That's right. And that seems to be a serious challenge as human beings. The way you grow and develop is step outside your comfort zone some. The biggest thing is, is the fear that you're going to do something wrong or say the wrong thing or describe something the wrong way. I like your advice. Just acknowledge that, yes, that will happen and can happen. Mm -hmm. Just go with it and use it as a learning experience. If you need to apologize, if you push in a way that you later find out that you shouldn't have and trying to convey a, a valid point, then you learn and move on and you do a better job next time. Do you develop that courage muscle as you described it? And you may not be as isolated as you think. And maybe when you speak out and you thought Bob from accounting was going to do it with you and he didn't, and you just are mortified. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I said this. Now Bob from accounting, he didn't help me. And everyone thinks I am just crazy. Mary in operations might pull you aside and say, I'm really glad that you said that. I'm really glad that you did that. I'm really glad you wrote that email. I really appreciate it. You just have to give yourself the patience. Um, Like I said, it's not going to be a ticker tape parade. The people who who did the the good trouble, if you will, those leaders, those, those historical figures that we all admire, they faced enormous challenges. They were out on a limb often and had no idea how it was going to go. And we have to sort of get comfortable with that as well, I think. Maybe the accolades will come at a time later, but that's not why we should do it. The people who are really good at being courageous saying things that stepping out beyond how others might see themselves doing it, they didn't just start doing that. And that was them. They had to build that. They had to develop that. And you don't see all the work that went behind it to get them to that point. Right. And it it takes practice. And there are small ways. You don't have to wait until the shareholders meeting to stand up and uh, say your piece, you know, baby steps along the way, looking at the coalition that you have, if there is a particular change that you see and you and Bob in accounting are kind of aligned with it, what is Bob's strength here? Maybe Bob's strength is he'll be the behind the scenes person, but I'm the one who is actually going to vocalize it and uh, having conversations about how we would implement or how we would introduce the kinds of conversations or the kinds of changes that we want to see and what is realistic to expect and that we might slip and fall. And being open to adding different people to the coalition, maybe Mary now, who we didn't even know thought was a good idea. Mary's coming to us and saying it's a good idea. And she would like to see some of those changes implemented as well, or has a great idea to be helpful to kind of help us over the finish line. Action is better than inaction. The hopelessness that some of us feel because there's just so many things happening around us that we just feel very powerless against those things. I feel like personal courage, professional courage, those are things that we can do every day to help us be the change, you know, that that saying, be the change you want to see in the world. I really do think it requires that intention behind it. My thanks to Robin Stimson. If you'd like to learn more about Robin, go to the show notes. 
And if you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and leave a voicemail message for up to one minute. I'd like to thank those who donate to the show. Your contributions makes a difference because this is an all-volunteer service. I'd like to thank you for listening. This is Gary DePaul. Until next time, lead on.